Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted, episode four. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. I'm going to start Ooh, to... I, oh, and I'd like off. to say I'm not Nick Hilton. And for all those of you who I've been wondering why I was called Nick Hilton, it's because he's my editor for something I do on the Catholic Herald. And I, I have the cheap, free and easy and useless Zoom uh, thing and I had to borrow it from him to get the pro thing but it upsets so many people and also caused me a certain amount of personality disturbance so I'm now back on the cheap one in my own name there we are I need to put the record straight we can assure you it's the real Gavin Ashenden yeah. uh, okay I'm going to start today with a quote by George Orwell in 1984 which goes he could not help feeling a twinge of panic. It was absurd since the writing of those particular words was not more dangerous than the initial act of opening the diary. But for a moment, he was tempted to tear out the spoiled pages and abandon the enterprise altogether. He did not do so, however, because he knew that it was useless. Whether he wrote down, down with Big Brother or whether he refrained from writing it made no difference. Whether he went on with the diary or whether he did not go on with it made no difference. The thought police would get him just the same. He had committed, would still have committed, even if he had never set pen to paper, the essential crime that contained all others in itself. Thought crime, they called it. Thought crime was not a thing that could be concealed forever. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years, but sooner or later, they were bound to get you. Well, our friend, our, our fellow Catholic, Caroline Farrow, has recently been in some trouble. She was arrested for, well, we're not quite sure what for, but in a culture that's becoming increasingly anti-Christian, anybody who sticks their head above the parapet and tries to defend what we know to be true finds themselves uh, facing this potential so-called thought crime, it seems. Gavin, what can you tell us about what's been happening with Caroline Farrow? Well, the first thing is she didn't do anything. Um, and the reason we know she didn't do anything is because at the time that a particularly unpleasant tweet was put out, which she was accused of writing, that it was anonymous, she was in the middle of playing the organ in mass. And as she pointed out to the police, however clever organists are with their two hands and two feet and single nose, you can't tweet and play the organ at the same time. But the fact was it was an anonymous tweet. And, and then of course the accuser was an anonymous person, except it wasn't. It was a notorious trans activist who goes out of his way to make life completely and utterly miserable by making accusations for hate crime, thought crime, just what you described, against uh, anybody who questions the dogma of, of trans activism. And it wasn't just Caroline, she's been, um, she's, she's been defended by, uh, by, by a lawyer, Mark John Yalland. Adrian Yalland. A Adrian, ya Adrian Yalland. Uh, we always go to Mark for the facts in this show. And uh, one of the things that he did on Twitter was to explain how he has had a whole series of ac accusations of professional misconduct from this trans activist made to him both to the Bar Council and to his Inns of Court. All of them have been repudiated, but they all take time. And there's always the question of, is there any smoke without a fire and mud sticking? So it's not just Caroline, uh, it's, it's anybody who dares to take these people on and comes to their attention. It could be any of us, but the fact is Caroline's taken them on because the Catholic faith is very clear about gender, about human nature, uh, about dogma. And Caroline's made, Caroline has felt called for some time to be an articulate apologist for the faith. Uh, now, most of the time, I I've, I tread very carefully around trans activists. Uh, I mean, I mean, already we've had a few uh, trolls on our own pages here, and we'll have a few more. And some people have asked why why, why we beeped why we beeped Catherine last week. It was a joke, guys. I mean, Mark and I thought that it'd be very funny, and we still think it's funny. Actually, even Catherine thinks it's funny. Especially Catherine thinks it's funny, um, but because YouTube has terms and conditions, and we'll probably break them. And that we don't we don't set out intentionally to do it it's just that youtube facebook google twitter they're all drawing the, the the terms and conditions in order to do what catherine read out at the beginning you know well 
he had the thought crime. So Caroline was accused of it. The police came around, and then of course it should have been nothing. They 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 should simply have asked, "You've been accused of this. We want to clarify. Did you do it?" And she would have said, "No, I couldn't have done." And there's no proof, and they should have gone away. What they actually did was burst into her home over supper. If not technically arrest her, then. Uh, etymologically arrest her they arrested her and carted her off to the station where they locked her up she said they wanted to do this to grab all her devices which they did she gave them all the passwords and they gave her an utterly miserable time and totally traumatized her poor husband who's a faithful and excellent catholic priest and her dear children and why did they do this well that's the question so the best thing that some of us can do and we've we've tweeted rude things not rude things challenging things to the crime commissioner uh, and to the police but i mean what you know, there isn't a great deal we can do except kick up a fuss. But, but the problem is, it's my mind, that Caroline should not be left. She's at the very sharp end and we're somewhere down near the middle soft end. But <laughs> there are lots of Catholics in this country. Uh, there are lots of Christians in this country. There are lots of liberals in this country and humanists. It shouldn't be left to Caroline to, to, to bear the weight of the thought police because the rest of us are all too cosy and, and, and um Com, what's the com word? Compromised <laughs> to, to make a fuss on her behalf. Luckily, she's going, she's got an interview in the mail on Sunday. I hope it makes a hell of a fuss. And I'm not swearing, I'm using the word theologically. Well, no, I hope that. Um, I think that what worries me is that they'll come for us, you know, they'll come for all of us. And it's this is insidious the way that this works. And it's becoming all encompassing. It seems to be uh, an ideology that drives everything. Um, I'm particularly worried because I don't think you can, you see it in a lot of um, public organisations like the police and the NHS, where they are paying large sums of money uh, to individuals who are basically coming up with ideas, ways to promote this agenda. In the, and, and you can imagine as an employee, if you're a nurse or a policeman, and uh, you're told that you have to celebrate this, that or the other, especially if you're not particularly morally you know informed or you you know most people seem to sort of go by the the idea that if you're not harming anyone then it's okay these days um they, they haven't got any moral or logical foundation to their that we don't we're not taught logic at school anymore are we so mm. they kind of think that they have to go along with it so it's very it's not really surprising at all is it that that it's going on Catherine, was that the new hand signal saying you want to speak or did you just scratch your nose? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We've all by we've, we've agreed to have a little hand signal. Uh, I didn't know about that. <laughs> when someone wants to get it. <laughs> okay, but <well>, anyway, so <laughs> that doesn't do very nicely. I could I try to something thing. subtle like anyway, that. Um, yeah. There was there was something I wanted to add, but I didn't want to cut in front of you. Yeah. And that is that that uh, Andrew Doyle has written this really excellent book called The New Puritans. Uh, and, and he explains how this has become a religion. Uh, uh, and essentially it's virtue signaling. It's virtue signaling by people who have no religion anymore and want to show how pious and moral they are because they feel so crap inside. Uh, because the human condition is to feel crap inside. And so... You know, I mean, religious people are very bad at it, but non-religious people, it turns out, are even worse at it because there is no constraint at all within the dynamics of this new religion. It has all the attraction of denouncing your neighbour, Pharisaicism, uh, Pharisaicism. Yes, that's right. Pharisaic? Yes, Pharisaicism. It's one of those things, isn't it, that you can really recognise in the way that the, that the left sort of approaches these issues, that it becomes, like you say, um, you know, something that they're trying to virtue signal but it breaks down continually where it, you can't be uh, woke enough can you you can't be you, it's constantly getting worse and worse and worse and so they end up attacking each other and attacking everything you must see it at school quite a lot Catherine yeah well it's you and I were speaking earlier Mark it, uh, it's a bit of that thing Jordan Peterson talks about where he says if you lived in total comfort and you had every need met you would chew your own arm off just to have something to do and it's it's partly a case of we're so spoiled we're so utterly spoiled you know we we have we have so much and we have so much to be grateful for and instead we're trying to pick fights because we lack meaning you know our lives lack meaning i think this is the thing you know it goes back to that augustine quote which is relevant to every single conversation we have which is our hearts are restless until they find rest in him in mm. god 
and there's that restlessness and it's coming out in these ways it's coming out in you know attacking people for this making an issue out of this we talked uh, earlier as well mark about pride the pride march you know that there are people marching on with in the pride month and you think well actually we've come a long way so if you're if you're in a, a same-sex couple you can have a civil marriage uh, there's no there's no laws that say you can be discriminated against and yet we have people marching with uh leather chaps and uh you know things that you wouldn't want Just your children to see but you wouldn't want your children to see and you think what no. are you doing this for mm. what, what is this for what are you hoping to achieve i think you can understand though can't you that that these are seen you know they're sold to us as good things you know and you can see that people have got good intentions and i think it's important that we acknowledge that and those intentions are to be you know nice to each other to be tolerant to be caring and you know that's sort of the motivation um but it's a it's it's not it doesn't work out that way does it well it's romans chapter one paul makes it very clear that we we all have a connection with god which is hardwired into us uh, and as Catherine was saying we it's expressed by a number of things first of all a longing for it for him uh and and a sense of disturbance until we find him but that disturbance is is expressed in bad religion basically you either have good religion or bad religion one of the things i get quite cross about um and go on and on about when i'm talking to atheists is this artificial distinction between secularism and religious is completely wrong the the, the secular are equally religious it's a, a, a yeah. and this you can describe mm. this is very clear when you say look we all have world views so the the secularist lives by faith he lives by faith that there is nothing out there he can't prove it so he has to assume it that's a that's a faith position and having assumed that original faith position a whole load of dogmatic truths then emerge which they hold to in principle it's exactly the same as as, as religion it's the difference is that religion does faith well and secularism and psychological existential angst does it really badly and that's why it's so disruptive and we could you know we we could have a, a long discussion into why you know there's a longing for there's a longing for moral standards but but no absolution no forgiveness uh, there's longing for meaning but but um uh, it becomes you know your own private meaning and not anybody else's there's longing for love but it's entirely uh, solipsistic and not not agape so you know there's one could go down the checklist but basically secularism uh secularism and um uh, and, and hedonism and wokeness is is a is a bum and bust form of religion andrew doll is very very good on this in his book and i suppose it's that uh, you know you can see in society that no one feels guilt anymore no one is self-convicting but everyone is ashamed yeah uh, it's a similar sort of I, I find that absolutely fascinating actually and i'd love to be able to articulate the clear difference between um that sort of religious that religious sense that we can see in people in our society and the you know the the way that religion lex arande lex credende you know the, the right sort of um if we order our attentions in the right direction then it leads us further up the path um to heaven you know it, and it makes us feel better about who and what we are as well doesn't it so, so, so can i correct you uh, and say that i think you, i mean you introduced exactly the two right categories shame and guilt but but i think you've gotten the wrong way around i i, I mean take take me on by all means but i think it's that uh, everyone feels guilty but no one feels shame so that the the guilt is is this bad conscience and no absolution that everyone has there is no absolution to be had anywhere and so everyone is feeling guilty and it's precisely because they feel guilty that all this virtue signaling erupts as an antidote to it but going back to your to your men in leather leather goods with their dogs no one feels shame the idea that we can have these pride matches marches which are full of of, of, of well you know you know all the words i mean the, mm. uh, exhibitionism uh, really isn't it it was a kind of sexual eroticized hedonistic exhibitionism of the mm. worst possible taste utterly abusive potentially abusive of the of the other and take children to them yeah. that's where there should be shame <laughs> but there is no shame so i think mark you were quite right it's it's attention from guilt and shame but but in my opinion i think uh, people are very guilty and they've lost the capacity to feel shame you can see that that's surely that's sort of drawn out of a uh, that people 
they want to be able to they they have feelings that they're trying to deal with and they don't want to be ashamed of those feelings and so they try to legitimize them is that yes. would you say that's correct and it's this and i don't i think the reality is that ultimately it doesn't make them feel any better about what's going on and obviously to anyone with a brain it looks absolutely awful um and so it just it keeps getting worse and split and that's that is that fracture um you know the greek word for the for the devil for the enemy is diablos which means the scatterer doesn't it and it's that constant fracturing that you see uh in the in this sort of argumentation this philosophy that um really points to the fact that it's not the right path i think <laughs> we, we we go to that word community so i think part of the problem is our culture has no unifying identity anymore we've lost our christian culture our christian identity that binds us um so community this idea that we have a common purpose and share a common value we don't have and i want to go please to the words of, of peter craft here um, which he talks about cops as in police and conscience and he says social bodies as well as individual bodies need shields like the physical like the body physical the body politic has two shields against chaos the outer shield is positive law that is human law which is enforced physically by police the inner shield is natural law moral law not made by man but discovered which is enforced spiritually by conscience the inner shield is made of freedom the outer shield is made of force. The inner shield is love, love of the good. The outer shield is fear, the fear of punishment. And love is free while fear is unfree. A community with fewer inner cops, inner police, needs more outer cops, outer police. And I think this is the problem. We, we, we As our consciences and our moral compasses go awry, we now find this totalitarian oppression and we see things as happened to poor Caroline and, and many others besides and as you say we should we should not be afraid to say um you know we 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 support those who speak up for what is true you know this is brilliant I'd never I hadn't seen it before but I do now uh, it's precisely the absence of the inner thought police that has led to the expression of the outer thought police and that's brilliant I mean of course that's why that's, of course, that's why the outer force is policing our thoughts, because there is no conscience, there is no shame, there is no mechanism, there is no, oh, Catherine, that's brilliant, or Kreeft, well, which, of, yeah. which of the two of you it was. Well, that's, that's, I, that's a, you know, I've, I've been kind of lamenting, <laughs> oh, this Orwellian terrible stuff, this this ghastly situation, you know, this, 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 this satanic... Uh, investigation into the into the into the heart with malice, but it's but it's all about the and you can see where I'm going to go with this because we 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 kind of semi planned this. It's all about the withdrawal of real religion, real moral structures, uh, and in their absence, out there are no internal thought police, and so we get the external thought police. Brilliant, very clever. Yeah. When it comes back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and when you think about it, doesn't it very clearly? Um, and as society breaks down and becomes more secular, those uh, basic Christian moral ideas um, slowly break down so that we're not able to distinguish between what's right and wrong anymore. There's no clear idea of what's right and wrong. Mm. Th those obvious right and wrongs have been replaced with these um, relativistic sort of terms, which the, you know the police and other bodies are trained in. Um, and so they go around policing the wrong things, don't they? You and can't get happens? anyone to come around if you get robbed. No. But, um, God forbid you should say something mean on the internet because there'll be a van load of coppers out the front before you can say, take me to Nick, please. <laughs> without, without wanting to do Catherine's job for her, what happens when you go to church where, which you can't tell the difference between right and wrong? Yeah. Are we moving on? Well, we don't have to. But I'll edit this. It's fine. I'll edit all this out. <laughs> They says we got to thirty minutes, and we, we were we were only we? We, we 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 agreed we we're only going to use the the you know we were going to move on to the other to yeah, to, right. to Nazar Ali. Don't don't edit it out. There's no need. This is I will. This is, <laughs> this right, is everyone. The, I want to talk for another goes. hour about religious freedom before we, yeah. begin, <laughs> before we begin. Buckle up, folks. Here we go. Here we go. We're moving on. Apparently. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to you no no it's, it's good it's good okay right i think mark 
I'll move on to you. You can you can come in on Nazir Ali. Oh, great. OK. Well, so um, our friend, I think we can pretty fairly say now, um, Michael Nazir Ali, who was received into the church recently, um, was one of the biggest brains in Anglicanism. So it was a real, I think, a real shock. And certainly I know the ordinariate priests, so the, the priests who were Anglican and uh, joined the Catholic Church, We've got, we've got the largest contingent in Brentwood of any uh, diocese in the country, I think, um, which I think is the, the Holy Spirit sense of humour because our last bishop was um, very, very Anglican <laughs> and wouldn't make a move without referring to the to Stephen Cottrell, who was the Bishop of Chelmsford at the time. Um, and then he had to explain to him why all these Anglicans were becoming Catholic. But anyway, that's by the by. Um, all those guys, the Anglican guys, the ex-Anglican guys that I know, were all absolutely blown away by this move from uh, Michael Nazir Ali. And they were all saying what a brilliant mind he was and what a, a great asset um, to the Church of England. And what a great asset he would be, therefore, to the Catholic Church. And um, all three of us have had the opportunity to um, have a chat with uh, Michael Nazir Ali and What's interesting, I think, particularly about his conversion story is that he came from the evangelical wing um, of the Anglican Church. So if you don't know, Gavin will probably correct me because he knows a lot more about it than me. The, the Anglican Church is a broad church, isn't it, Gavin? It tries to accommodate a broad spectrum of belief. So um, some of the guys, some, some Anglicans are Catholic to all, you know, you wouldn't know any different if you went to Mass I mean, you know, there's a the Anglican Church here prays for the Pope and it uses the same liturgy and the same readings and you wouldn't know you weren't in the Catholic Church. It even says Catholic Church of Leon C over the door of the of the Anglican Church here. And of course, it was Catholic at one point, but um, it's not anymore, sadly. Um, so the point being really that it's understandable why those Catholic, well, you would have thought that the Catholic Anglicans would have come through the door of Anglicanorum Chaitibus very, very quickly. Um, but in but there's been a bit of a block there, uh, which is really interesting. Why has there been, why didn't they, you know, a lot of the guys who were involved in Forward in Faith didn't come over, did they, Gavin, you know, for one reason or another? And why are now evangelical Anglicans becoming uh, Catholics, you know, which is a great thing. I think we know the answer, don't we, but we're going to, we're going to flesh it out a bit. I wish you'd use a different word. A different... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's lots so much in there. So first of all, Michael, the, the, Anglic the Anglicans didn't want Michael Nazir Ali. He was tipped to become Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and, you know, he would have ticked all the boxes. Uh, he was brown. Uh, he was clever, a minority, uh, and, and also rather holy. I mean, Michael has an air of somebody who says his prayers which is about as close as you can get as, as an external observer. But he was scuppered by, by the powers that be because for some, quite some time, the people in charge of appointments were weeding out anybody who appeared to be orthodox. And Michael's very orthodox as a Christian. So that was very wounding and very hurtful for him. Uh, it's hard to be, it's hard to have your, inter your vocation because I think he had a vocation to be Archbishop of Canterbury. It's hard to have it interrupted by skullduggery and backstabbers on committees, especially if they're feminists. Uh, yeah, well, they were feminists. That's right. So, so that was the first thing. The, 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 so, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm now going to be rude about a whole load of people, and I'll try and, I'll try and be rude charitably. God help me. Um, the Anglo-Catholics who've come over uh, to, to, to Catholicism in the last twenty years have been really magnificent people, and they paid a price for it—a really high price. Uh, and uh, and it's a miracle that the ordinary had opened up like that. But the prop, but there are there are good things and bad things about Anglo-Catholicism. So the good thing is that it sees that the Catholic faith is the right faith. It's true. It's beautiful. It's real. It says the right things about about the sacraments and about the church. And it and it handles transcendence and imminence well. It understands liturgy and and the whole choreography of holiness. But the bad thing about it is the Anglicans who do it 
do it cheap. It's like it's like ripping off a video and not paying not paying the higher costs because they don't pay any price for it. They don't, and so they're, they're not under any kind of authority. Uh, they say they're Catholic, but they're not because to be Catholic involves a sacrifice of humility and obedience, and you put yourself into the hands of the church for the church to do what it wants for you, as both Michael and I have done. Uh, and so I, <laughs> I once saw this lovely, lovely video of an elderly ex-Anglican priest who became a Catholic say, I'm so glad I've become a Catholic and I love my Anglican days and I'm never going to say anything at all horrible about Anglicanism. It gave me so much and I thought, oh, I should really do that. That's a, that's a lovely attitude. But I'm afraid I find myself saying all kinds of unpleasant things. But partly, unpleasant is the wrong word. I find myself weighing up Anglicanism in the scales and finding it really badly wanting. So badly wanting that I didn't realise how badly wanting it was when I was one. And, I, and what I mean by that is I didn't realise the dreadful confusion about the sacraments. That, that you know, we, that you go down and you, you give the, the Holy Eucharist, supposedly the body of our, I mean, Catholics in the Anglican Church say this is the body of our Lord. And they believe in transubstantiation, though they don't have the power to practice it. And evangelicals totally diss it, so much so that they, they take bits out of the liturgy, like the Agnus Dei. When I, when I was at Theological College, I was teaching, uh, you, you must stop me if I go on too long, I'm beginning to, to feel I'm getting a rant coming on, but I was teaching the, the music to a, to a setting and the principal came up and said, uh, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, well, you know, thank you for doing that, that's the end of that. And I said, no, there's the Agnes Day next week. No, you can't teach that. I said, well, what's wrong? Is it the music? No, he said. He said, and then he whispered, as though we were talking about some private sexual peccadillo. He said, the brethren might be misled into thinking there's a connection between the bread and our Lord Jesus Christ. I said, but that's what the prayer book says. Even the prayer book says there's a connection. No, he says, we're not having it. Can't do it. Mm -hmm. So you have this, you know, you talked about a broad church, Mark, but it isn't a broad church. It's a church of conflicting, of, of, of conflicting coalitions. Uh, and they don't have the courage to, uh, to, be, to be honest about how badly they conflict. There's a huge amount of party spirit and sniping behind it. Um, and so and, and the reason why so many Anglo-Catholics have not come over is because they're very comfortable in a highly permissive gay culture. Uh, and I don't want to say any more about that because it would be unpleasant and distasteful. Um, but I was asking a very senior member of the Ordinariat uh, who knew, who knows Anglo-Catholicism inside out. Uh, I won't mention names. I wouldn't, don't have to. And I said, why haven't they come? And he agreed that, that they, 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 they didn't want, they did not want to be accountable for their lifestyles, even in the new Bergolian Catholic culture. It's exactly so, what I've heard, to be honest. So I think that um, what's interesting is if you, the, the, hopefully Catherine will be able to put in the, in the description, the, the link to the interview that uh, Michael Nezareel has done with the pillar. Um, and what's really interesting there is that he, he says his reasons or, the, you know, like, why has he come across? And the most, I think, the, the key reason is the way that decisions are made. So in the Anglican Church, it's uh, sort of by consensus. I think um, Justin Welby has recently said that, and I think um, Michael Nazarelli quotes him as saying that, you know, that decisions about faith are made by consensus and... Um, even then people are free to disagree with that. Whereas in the Catholic Church, we're much more serious about the apostolic nature. That is that the faith is not something we meddle with. So things like female ordination, which I know is, is your specialist subject, Catherine, isn't it? Yeah. Is something that um, we can't change, can we? No. That's, that's really the only answer you need. We don't. We can't change it, and it will never change. But that's because it's it's not within our. It's not because we're being misogynistic or anything like that. It's because of what's proper to a woman and what's prop. You know, yeah. like man, men can't have babies. I know yeah. some people would argue with that these days. Well, but... that's another video altogether, which we'll get onto yeah. maybe another week. Women's ordination, but certainly it's nothing to do with that. And um, people have to think carefully about what it what they're really saying when they say well jesus lived in a misogynistic culture so he just went along with it i mean he's god so 
uh, that isn't the answer. So we have to delve deeper, which we will do another time. But yes, carry on. Well, I'm just going to say that I, I think that it's brilliant that he's been drawn to the Catholic faith mm -hmm. by the beauty of the deposit of, you know, like the deposit of faith. And the fact that we've got the two things that he mentions in the interview are the catechism of the Catholic Church and the fact that we have a supreme uh, like arbiter who in the person of the Pope. So if there is a dispute in, among the faithful, then they go to Peter and Peter is the one who arbitrates what's right and what's wrong. And that must have been something, would, would that be a similar um, thing for you as well, Gavin? Is that what drew you to it? Partly. I mean, part of my life involved becoming a bishop for the continuing Anglican Church and drawing, attempting to draw together four or five different Anglican groups um, who are outside the Church of England. And it, I, I rapidly saw what I should have known, but, you know, you don't see things until you've experienced them, that it was completely impossible without a magisterium. Not only did you have egos and misunderstanding and incompetence, which, which we all shared, but you had different, entirely different approaches to scripture and tradition. And there was no referee. And so I suddenly realized, although this was a very good idea to try and draw together the best bits of Orthodox Anglicanism, it turned out to be completely impossible. You, you could not do it without, you could not remain a, a one, to be one holy Catholic apostolic church, you had to be a Catholic, a paid up, believing, sacrificing, committed Catholic. There was no other way of doing it. So that was one important thing. But the, but the other, for me, the other things were that I, I, I lived for a long time with the fear that when I went to the Eucharist, um, uh, the, sac the, the, the sacrament was just a series of blanks of, of dead, dead pieces of bread because the clergy were not authentically ordained as to be sacrificial priests who had the power and the grace and the charism and the authority to do the miracle that happens every time mass is celebrated in the Catholic Church. And in the end, the pain and the anxiety of that got too much for me. And, and, and I thought this is and also there was a ghastly moment when I was I was really quite critical I was I was helping it with it with the chalice um, about the year before I came over and I was using the Cranmerian words um, the, the, to one the first person you say this is the, the blood of Christ given for thee shed for thee preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life and the next person say, drink this in memory he died for you and be thankful so basically it's it's transubstantiation to the first person and it's Vingley nothing's nothing's happening here guys nothing to see move on to the other and as I'd, I'd been involved in, in, in issues of domestic abuse uh, for, for, a, for a while helping people and I suddenly realized this was a form of this was a form of domestic abuse I love you very very much I love you so much you can have everything you want that's transubstantiation uh, you can't have it there's nothing here um, punishment rejection uh, evacuation um, a, a form of, of, of spiritual violence <laughs> Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of hug, slap, hug, slap as we were going. But I thought, this is terrible. This is this is not complementary, complementary theology. This is not inclusion across a plot and spectrum. This is a form of spiritual and ecclesial domestic violence. And it's terrible. Either this is a miracle where Jesus comes to you utterly and completely transformed in a miracle in the bread and the wine. Or it's a kind of ecclesial picnic party where you're invited to have nice thoughts. But there's no way of bridging the two. They, they involve they involve two utterly different worldviews about matter and spirit, about authority and, and, and pneumatic power. Um, and the idea you could just put them into one, one liturgy, as Cranmer did, is, is just, it's quite postmodern in, it, in, its, in its ludicrousness. So, and so for me, it was, it was a mass and also Our Lady. I, I very badly wanted access to Our Lady without the feeling that I was causing other people trouble, because when we might talk about this later on, that you only have to mention your love for Our Lady and her reality and her importance and the rosary. And people have violent reactions. They either violently say, absolutely, I love her. Look how she kicks ass in the spiritual world. More of Our Lady, more of the rosary. Or they say, get thee behind me, you, you, you worshipper of the, of the, the Baaless of heaven. And, and when you try and have a rational theological look, conversation it can't happen which means you're into some kind of spiritual paradigm and so I, I i got so fed up with being away from our lady so for me it was our lady and mass for michael it was it was good order authority ecclesial coherence and all the things he'd looked for in anglicanism that anglicanism ultimately failed to provide but the catholic church did absolutely amazing i think it's like the eucharistic thing is really interesting 
um, because it's, it's a conversation that I find easy to have with my friends who are not Catholics. Um, and it's something that they really seem to hunger for. Uh, they have their little communion services and they've got their uh, things that they say. If you if you talk about the real presence, they've got their little explanations. Uh, you know, like if you say, you know, oh, that's not what Jesus doesn't say. I am a, uh, a symbol. This is a symbol of my body, you know, or whatever. And they say, oh, yeah, but he says about the, um, he says oh, it's a cat. Leo, you never <laughs> talk to me. Why are you here? Um, so... Yeah, so, uh, so can, like, I, can, can I just please do. just well because it's so important because on, on the one hand so the good you know, everything has a good and a bad side by some virtue so the virtue of the Anglo-Catholic movement is it wants transubstantiation bless mm. it quite right all ten out of ten full credit to it there's nothing in the in the Zwinglian biscuit so absolutely um, so what's the but point the, of it <laughs> well but the, but the problem is apostolic curi. So when Catholic, uh, when the Catholics began to flood back into England and there was, looked like there was going to be a parallel Catholic church to the Anglican church, somebody had to decide upon the Anglican claims that they were the continuing Catholic church in this country because they looked like they were because they robbed us of the churches and the cathedrals. They nicked the churches and the cathedrals and then they began to imitate the vestments uh, in the 19th century. So they, 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 they were in, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law and they dressed up to look like they were the owners. But the problem was that, that they, they said, we want to be Catholics. So then you have to ask the Pope. You have to defer to the Pope if you're a Catholic. And the Pope looked at it and he said, you know, you're not Catholics. You do not have a, you do not have a sacramentally authentic priesthood. Even if there had been some continuity, which was doubtful, and that's a problem. For over 100 years, you, you had no intention of consecrating, of ordaining priests as the catholic church understand it you will date ministers it's in your liturgies in fact and it's in your articles you were extremely careful not to ordain sacri uh, sacrificial priesthood so he said you can't have it both ways you haven't got an authentic sacrificial priesthood don't pretend that you have and this is the problem this is the language. apostolic rule of leo the 13th that you're talking about here, yeah right? ab absolutely right yeah. and so declared anglican orders null and void that's right and so how can you say how can you say I'm a faithful Anglican Catholic and entirely repudiate the papal bull that says, no, you're not. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, you know, there's no, there's no two ways around it. It's, you can't, you cannot be a disobedient Catholic and say, or a disobedient aspiring Catholic while pretending to be an obedient Catholic. It's not, not fair. So it's, so it's dishonest. And, and again, you have to pay the price for the mass. You have to join the, the Church of Augustine and Ignatius of Antioch uh, and, and, uh, and Thomas of there's great There's great satisfaction in that as well, isn't there? There's great satisfaction in feeling part of that universal family, I think, is something that I've heard expressed uh, by people coming into the church, which is a wonderful thing. But what do you say? I think that um, it's really interesting. You see, if, you, if you're on the internet at all, you can see... Uh, things like Francis Chan, who's a Baptist minister, and, and lots of people seem to be delving into the fathers, a lot of evangelicals. So there's that initial thing, like you say, that a lot of these things, a lot of the principles were set up to differentiate Protestant churches from the Catholic Church. And it's it seems to my eye anyway, and maybe I've got this completely wrong, that a lot of um, Protestant denominations are looking at the fathers, seeing what's taught there is most clearly the Catholic faith and are sort of, maybe they're not coming back to the Catholic church because they've perhaps been taught that it is the, the door to hell or whatever, you know, like that a lot of the evangelicals believe, but rather they've sort of mitigated or changed their practice to incorporate more and more Catholic elements. You know, they're sort of like Francis Chan is, is actually started to believe in the real presence, even though he's a Baptist and, you know, and then he sort of has reason to the point where, well, hang on, you can't have an open table theology if you believe this is the body and blood of Christ and no one's been prepared to receive it properly. You know, um, do you, would you say that, do you think that they're, they're, it's like the Holy Spirit, it seems to me, is, is moving. You know, Jesus prayed that we'd all be one in John 17 and, all right, there's been this horrible human breakdown, but are we moving can you see elements of that moving back together again? Well, you're asking for a prophetic uh, assessment and analysis yeah. of what's going it's on. It's not and, fair. And, 
<laughs> well, it's very, it's just very hard, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not adequately equipped to answer the question properly. But there are some people who are, and 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 they say, and I think I, I intuit too, that we're in this, we're in a very serious period of cultural and civilizational meltdown, and the forces that are coming against the culture and the and Christendom are are very powerfully antithetic to it. And so we're shaping up for a very serious and real fight that will almost certainly end up with the persecution of Christians that we've seen through every century in every part of the world. And what is God doing in response to that? He's drawing people into the only church that can combat it, the only church that can fight it, the only church that has been given the promise that it can withstand the gates of hell. And I think the way we're seeing that is that, is that the Holy Spirit is behind all this reading of the fathers it's certainly how it started with me once i began to read saint ignatius of antioch uh, and justin martyr uh, and polycarp um uh, there and, and Irenaeus of Lyon, particularly mm. you suddenly start saying i mean everyone starts saying the same thing oh my goodness they look catholic the mm. language you know what were the marks of, of of the of the church in the first three centuries uh they were the, one, uh, holy, yeah, one, one holy one holy catholic, catholic. And apostolic. But, but first of all, they were formed by apostolic teaching. You know, you, you, Polycarp, if you wanted to know what happened at the Mass, you just had to ask Polycarp, who was taught by John, who was there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it was the Mass. Um, they were, they, it was apostolic understanding, evangelism, Episcopal oversight, and, and, and martyrdom. And those, th those are the signs. And, and the next thing I discovered was, so I, I was badly taught at theological college. They taught me, and they weren't telling the truth that Calvin had really done a really good job of making himself acquainted with, with fathers. And Calvin was a patristic expert. And uh, it was precisely because he was a patristic expert that you could trust him when it came to reformatting an ecclesial community that went back to the roots of historic Christianity. That just wasn't true. Calvin was very prejudiced. Uh, and the stuff he wanted, the stuff he liked in the fathers, he nicked. And the stuff he didn't like, he obscured. I mean, it just wasn't true. And so, in fact, the whole Reformation structure is built, oh, it's built on a lie. And the lie is that that the early reformers uh, were, A, first of all, understood their Bible, and secondly, understood the fathers. They didn't understand the Bible, and they took it upon themselves to mutilate the Bible, as it happened, without any authority for it at all. And they reconstructed a Christianity that they pretended was in the uh, shoes of the apostles, but was in fact a heretical and schismatic splintering sectarian experiment in, in enlightenment uh, epistemology. And has it worked? No. So back no. to the drawing board. Back More fractures. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. It's, I think that brings us beautifully to Catherine and I had a little phone call, didn't we, this, yeah. this morning? And uh, where we were talking about exactly this, Gavin. And, you know, the, the image that I, try, I sort of tried to use to explain it was um, the men of the West you know, in Lord of the Rings before the gates of Mordor, you know, that it's like we're all gathering. And that's what I feel. Come on, brothers, you know, let's all mm. get together. And because this is, you know, I think I said in the first episode, this there's no doubt this is where the fight is going to be. You know, this is mm. we're the ones who are going to be, you know, it can't be anywhere else. 1.1 billion Catholics and 1.1 billion everything else. You know, <laughs> so, um, you know, we need to get together. We need to all get on the side of orthodoxy especially if we're on the side of Christ we've got to be that's that's got to be our driving um in you know the thing that encourages us and pushes us towards unity I think isn't it and not leave it to Catherine to Caroline Farrow yeah, yeah on her own yeah God love yeah. her yeah, yeah God love her yeah excellent well I think we'll leave it there for today thank you and uh, you can join us next week to see which one of us struggles to say complementarity <laughs> <laughs> Or Phariseeism. I think, it's your, I think it's your turn, Mark. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we'll be back. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been very patient in listening to Catholic Unscripted number four. There's plenty more to come, folks, God willing. <laughs>